I'm going to I'm going to leave the uh, privilege of um, introducing our esteemed speaker to Dr. Kester. Um, but first, I wanted to just make a really quick plug for um, the upcoming events that we have, and then we'll jump straight into the talk. So this is a joint session of the Qualitative Working Group based at UC San Francisco and the Qualitative Methods Community of Practice based at University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Um, upcoming, we have a bunch of really great seminars this year. So uh, we have one on January 23rd um, by Dr. Jane G and Anthony Wen. And then on March 12th, we have a talk by Dr. April Bell and on May 22nd by Dr. Michael Duke. So really great stuff coming up. In addition, we're gonna be announcing a um, colloquium on qualitative uh, research in the health sciences. So keep a, keep a lookout on the listservs, both the QWG and the QNCOP. We've got a lot of great stuff coming up. And without further ado, I should pass it over to Kim. Thanks, Julia. I, I want to just say that um, our focus, and this wasn't intentional, it's just the way that it's turned out, that the 2023-24 um, QCOP Qualitative Working Group series is focused a lot on analysis, and that's always a need that people have. This year, the analytic strategies people are bringing forward are really unique, and so we are excited to just kick this off today. So first, I would just want to say warm welcome, but a huge thank you to you, Jason, for agreeing to come and talk about uh, what I think is going to be a really exciting topic for us. So thank you. Uh, so Jason Johnson Peretz is an Oxford-trained medical anthropologist and qualitative research analyst at UCSF. And he is among very close colleagues in this room that are here. I just want to point out Carol and Sarah Guten. I understand you work closely with Jason. Jason's, um, his research focuses on serving LGBT and HIV affected communities. His research interests have developed via increasingly in inclusive views of health from the holism of Chinese medicine through the social determinants of health to global health governance and the role of ethics, equity, and politics, and the role they play in shaping individual and social well-being. I uh, don't think I knew this about you, Jason, but you also hold a master's degree in Catholic theology. I do. Um, many, many it was times. actually my first master's degree before oh, I, I ended up that. doing medical anthropology. Yes, I did know that. I did know that. Jason, you are here to tell us about remote team-based in a inductive analysis using digital tools to foster equity and collaboration in global and qualitative global health research. And this is a model that you have coined um, with the name R8. So thanks for being here and I'll let you present to us. Great, thank you. So I will return to shared screen mode. <clears throat> so, as Kim mentioned, um, I will be talking about some of the remote tools that we use to foster equity in our global health team. And it's specifically going to focus on the, the concrete example of creating a code book through inductive analysis remotely. And I know many of us here are qualitative researchers, so the first few slides may not pertain exactly to us, but I always like beginning with a few definitions so that way we're all on the same page and we might also be joined by people who are not qualitative researchers. So as we know, qualitative methods encompass a variety of tools and approaches which aim to uncover what can't be captured numerically or through the quantification of data. And so grounded theory, phenomenology, general thematic analysis approaches are all examples of those qualitative methods. And inductive coding has become a mainstay of many of those quali qualitative methods that, that we used in our clinical research. But inductive coding itself has, it faces several constraints. It can be very time consuming, um, there can be budget issues, especially if you're a remote team and you want to meet in person to, to do the inductive coding. Something that we had encountered were also COVID era restrictions uh, on in-person meetings, especially since uh, our 
our teams are globally dispersed and the COVID lockdowns proceeded in a rolling fashion in different countries as the different waves um, hit each country. But that meant that we had to really be creative with the, the remote team-based tools. And we discovered that the remote team-based inductive analysis, which uses the digital methods, ended up fostering a lot of equity and collaboration in our group. And it um, brought the teams on the ground to do the interviewing, the translating, the transcribing, and the teams in the office. It brought us all closer together and allowed us to work um, much more uh, closely together. So I will be using several terms that I'm sure we're all familiar with, but even as qualitative researchers, we often come from different subdisciplines in the social sciences, and we can use these terms with slightly different meanings, even with a lot of overlap. So coding is simply categorizing segments of data with a short name that summarizes and accounts for each piece of the data. And um, inductive coding is one way of coding where you draw out the emergent um, findings from, from that data. You ask, all right, what's really going on here? What's in the background and not being explicitly said? What's another way we can um, name more abstractly what this person is saying about their concrete lived experiences? Uh, grounded theory coding is the name that uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I'll be applying to, to that type of inductive coding. And um, of course, I think in this era, we all understand what a remote team uh, means. So I've mentioned global health. And um, as Kim mentioned, I'm a qualitative research analyst. And specifically, I'm a qualitative research analyst with the Search Consortium of Studies or Search Umbrella of Studies. And Search it stands for the Sustainable East Africa Research and Community Health. And it's a partnership between UCSF and KEMRI, which is the Kenya Medical Research Initiative, and IDRC, which is the Infectious Disease Research Consortium based at Makerere University in Kampala, uh, Uganda. My qualitative team um, has members based in Kenya, Uganda, and California. And as a result, Generally, we meet bi-monthly, remotely, and only occasionally uh, a couple times a year in person. So we, we now have several years of experience developing the tools to facilitate communication um, and team-based analysis of qualitative data, both in person and remotely. And we first developed the method that I'll go over today for use um, with analyzing data from phase A of the search SAFIRE study. SAFIRE is a sub study within the, the search umbrella, which aims to address persistent drivers of the HIV epidemic in rural Kenya and Uganda, uh, the areas around Lake Victoria. So um, for anthropologists out there, that's uh, mostly Luwo, Kisi, and Ankole, Runankole ethnic group areas of um, Kenya and Uganda. So the search sapphire study was specifically looking at a dynamic choice model to um, both prevent and treat HIV. So we'd give people options um, for HIV self-tests or condoms, PrEP, PEP. Recently, we introduced long-acting capotegravir as well. And the option to switch between each of these methods uh, at will as their particular life circumstances dictated. And we conducted interviews with about 115 people drawn from several different uh, recruitment sites, antenatal clinics, outpatient clinics, social health teams. Those were all um, in the prevention arm of the study. We also interviewed mobile participants living with HIV. They are mobile because they tend to be uh, fisher folk, and so they go from, they basically need to um, follow the schools of fish and can end up far from their home community. 
when it's time for a refill for, for their ARVs. And we also interviewed providers. So that was the initial development for uh, this technique, but we've subsequently used it to develop codebooks for several other search associated studies. And as we've done so, we've uh, refined and nuanced things a little bit. So even though the presentation I'm giving right now is based on the paper uh, that we wrote for the initial development, I will be mentioning some of the, the nuances that we've, we've added. Um, <clears throat> so a little more background in terms of both the global health context and the East African context. So what my colleagues had mentioned to me was that typically in both Kenya and Uganda, uh, no one had really worked much with um, remote team-based coding. And typically researchers kind of higher up in the hierarchy would meet in person to develop the code book and they wouldn't always include um, the people on the ground who were going out and doing the interviews in that code book development. And some of these higher up researchers didn't necessarily have a background in qualitative research. And so they didn't understand what it entailed or the breadth of, of methods we use to um, develop our, our, our code books, our analytical uh, approaches to the data. As one of my colleagues in East Africa said, a lot of times these researchers are just asking themselves what qualitative work is all about. And I think all of us here who are qualitative researchers in clinical settings have encountered that sort of um, experience. Um, and so we wanted to address that on, on search. And we also wanted to be careful because in global health, often researchers in the global north take data that's been gathered in the global south and analyze it and publish papers on it and leave the, the people, the teammates in the global south um, without much input into some of these final products. And this is an issue of equity and social justice. And so we also wanted to, to address that. So typically what we had done was after data collection, um, translation and transcription, which tended to happen at the same time. The, the interviews we tended to conduct are conducted in, in multiple languages, in English, in Swahili, in Luo, and in Pronyakole. Um, we'd meet in person and um, do line-by-line -line inductive coding on hard copies of paper and discuss the, the findings and um, then develop a codebook together through an in-person meeting. And we did this because we wanted the, the insights from our team members who live and work in the communities where we're um, implementing the, the interventions, the study, and the teammates because they understand how people speak and um, the particular nuances of language and the customs and values, they were able to give insights that those of us who are not from there would have completely overlooked. And so as a result, not only were we able to begin addressing the structural barriers, we were also creating much more culturally rigorous uh, interpretations of the data. But then COVID happened, and so we had to figure out how to do things remotely, which brings me to the, the method itself. So the method, this is the, the bird's eye view. It consists of four to six steps, depending on how um, you want to, to split things or, or combine things together. Uh, we start with a team member developing an a priori code book from existing interview guides and research questions. Um, this is something that I typically do. And we do it because we want to make sure that the, the principal investigators who might not be qualitative Researchers, we want to make sure their concerns and questions are addressed as we code the data. But we also um, go through a small set of transcripts um, line by line to develop an inductive codebook, and then we combine the two. 
So the second step is assigning that transcript for line by line coding to um, the members of the team. They send that back to me. I merge them. We meet and review the comments, compare the language, and then we finalize a, a code book by integrating the inductive and a priori code books. So the rest of this talk is going to go into detail about how that happens. So the preliminary step is just making sure that the manuscripts are in Microsoft Word format, because if you're trying to um, merge Word documents and you have a, a PDF that suddenly appears, it's, it's not going to work out very well. And the other preliminary step is to have the a priori codebook already developed. And the reason is because that becomes a base structure for integrating inductive codes. If you're developing an inductive codebook and only using that, obviously you wouldn't necessarily need this a priori codebook. I don't share it ahead of time because I, I don't really want to prime the rest of the team members to the language that's used for those codes. And because the rest of the team, many of the people on the, the rest of the team have conducted the interviews that we're coding, they're already familiar with the kind of thematic groups that, that we cover. Um, for both the a priori and the inductive code books, the template I use typically has four columns, one for a parent code, one for the child codes that pertain to that parent code. Another column that has notes and often that in the final document becomes the column that defines that code. And then uh, a final column using examples. So what that looks like is something like this, where um, typically the child code, this should be actually 1.01.1. 1. 0. 1. 1, so that way you know that this child code belongs to this parent code, at least initially. Um, here's where the description and definition goes. And then this final column where we put the examples, it, the examples fall into two categories. One is the typical example of something we'd code with a, a particular child code. But then we also sometimes include an example of a quote, which after discussion with the team, we've decided should be included in that child code. So it's kind of the, the outlier that should still be included when we go to, to code the documents. And um, typically we use deduce to, to code the final documents after we've developed the code book. So step two is just sending out the transcripts to be coded. And um, usually I'll send out at least two, sometimes more depending on, on the total and of the, the qualitative um, study that we're doing. And um, since we have only about five people on the team, typically all five will code like transcript A and all five will code transcript B. But every now and again, we have six or seven people. And in those cases, I assign three or four people to code transcript A and then the, the rest of code transcript B. Now, what does it look like when I've sent out these Word documents and asked them to code? So what we found worked best for us is if each coder opens up the Word document and uses the comment function to code a line. And so just like in deduce, the coder selects a portion of the text, but instead of applying a code, they go to the comment function under the review tab in the ribbon, and the next page will show that. Clicks new comment and then writes their, their, their comment, their applies a, a code to that section of text. And we use um, Charmaz's inductive open coding method, which can be slightly nuanced depending on, on the particular social science discipline that each team member comes from. We have geographers, anthropologists, sociologists. So um, we sometimes use the same language differently and sometimes we use different language for the same, um, with the same meaning. So, um, to get to the, the comment, you go to the, the review 
option here that brings up the sub menu and, and here's here's the comment function here so you highlight for example i was a little suspicious you click comment and then you write feeling suspicious now one other element on the same tab that i want to draw your attention to is over here it's the compare documents function when you click the the down arrow you'll have the option to either compare documents or combine documents and this becomes important in in the next step but before i get there when we're doing this portion of the the open coding we do try to go line by line we're not looking at narrative um, chunks we we reserve that for other types of analysis not the development of the inductive codebook and we've um, written papers on on illness narratives for example so we don't ignore the the fuller narrative and the kind of larger picture but for right now what we're trying to do is go line by line or a sentence like why do i join the study you know falls on two lines then we try to have a full sentence and we try to keep the codes as short as possible because those are going to become the names that we input into deduce but we also want to show the actions and trace the progression of events from the participants point of view and so um, what Shomars has recommended and what we try to do is use uh, verbal phrases that begin with a gerund so an ing word like feeling suspicious or questioning benefits now you'll notice um, this second comment here is a bit longer than just feeling suspicious feeling suspicious is great only two words um, sometimes when I would be tempted to, to say just mimetic desire, but for the benefit of teams and the um, discussions that we have when we look at the comments, I, I wanted to gloss it. And so several team members will often have a parenthetical note or a little bit longer of a description of what's going on. As long as they have the, the initial very short kind of questioning benefits, um, everything flows very, very smoothly. So once all the coders have added their documents, they send them back to me as the, as the point person. And what I do when I receive them is I save the document with an underscore and then lowercase initials for, for each coder. So for me, it would be underscore JJP. And I put those in one folder and then I start merging the documents. Now, if you've had your coders work with transcript A and transcript B, when you begin merging the documents, make sure you're only merging coded transcript A with coded transcript A and coded transcript B with coded transcript B. Otherwise, you'll end up with a very, very interesting combined document, which, you know, might be very useful, but it um, won't give you the, the um, the results that we're looking for using this particular method. So the way to merge the documents is to, under that review tab, um, go to compare documents and then select combine documents. And what will happen is Word will pop up with a new window that asks you to select the original document. So for that, I would say transcript A, coder one, and then it asks you for a document to combine it with. This is the revised document. So then I put transcript A, coder two, and I press enter and Word merges the documents together. And you have a new document, which you can then save. And so I save it as transcript A underscore coder one underscore coder two. Was there a question? No. Okay. So then I iterate. And so I take um, the combined documents function again, and the original document for this second round would be the transcript A, coder one, coder two. And then I combine it with the revised document, coder three. And I save that as transcript A, coder one, coder two, coder three. And since typically we, we only have five coders, the um, document names become quite long, but not excessively long. And this is one reason why if we have six coders or more, I tend to break it up into two groups of, of three coders. 
Jason, may I just ask a um, a question that maybe others ha are having too? I um, am wondering how approximately how how many how long are these transcripts? I understand I've worked with translation, so I know they're they're always shorter than what um, you know an original language transcript looks like. But uh, just to give us a sense of how long are the transcripts? Number how so many pages. Sure. For the Search Sapphire um, transcripts, they tended to be about, they tended to actually be about 12 to 17 pages long. Um, the interviews typically lasted 45 minutes to an hour. Sometimes they went just over that. For another study, a hypertension study, those were a bit shorter. And the documents tended to be about 12 pages long. And the, the interviews were less than an hour. I think in most cases, less than 45 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> so this brings us to step five, which is where once all the documents are combined, we can then meet together and discuss the comments. And this can be a slow process, especially if you're using two transcripts and you can only show one transcript at a time. But what was really cool about this that we discovered was it visually displays our intercoder reliability. It, it shows us when we're using often the exact same language to code uh, more or less the same uh, amounts on, on a line of, of data. So what that looks like when you've merged all the comments together, the comments will appear on, on a sidebar of, of the Word document. And I took a screenshot here. And as you can see, we were all pretty much on the same page. And one of the things that we want to look at when we go over the comments is the similarities and differences in the language that, that each team member uses. So we've got little pay, low wages, little pay, and small pay. Um, so obviously, we're all on the same page in terms of little pay. So that would be a nice code name because we're all using the same language. But the other thing you want to look at is a little more of a big picture. And it's the, the consonants of, of ideas. You want to see how each person is interpreting that line of data. And as you can see here, two of us had interpreted the whatever statement was selected as being demotivated. But then two of us were much more neutral. And so this was an opportunity for the team to say, OK, well, are we is this person actually expressing that they're demotivated by the low pay? Or are they just saying, yeah, I don't get paid very much? And that sort of conversation then allows us to, as a team, understand whether we should code something like this as demotivating, when to interpret something as demotivating, and whether to have, say, demotivating as a parent code and then low wages as, as a child code. Um, also, when you're doing this is sometimes, you know, you'll have three people who have pretty much the same interpretation of the, the piece of data and then one person who doesn't. And this can either show when someone might need more coaching or training or experience in coding, but sometimes it's because the person has come from a different disciplinary background and they've got this amazing insight that the, the other coders had just totally overlooked. And so this portion of the, the method is really kind of exciting. And my team has mentioned multiple times that, that they enjoy this portion of, of the analysis because we're each able to bring our own particular insights into, into to the data, to the table and argue for one or the other perspective. Now, one of the ways we've nuanced this step is um, recently I had to create a code book um, with the team and we needed to, to get it done very quickly. And so what we decided was I would summarize all the comments and um, arrange them into thematic groups and then present those summaries to the team for discussion and integration um, into a finalized code book. If you're not merging code books, you can always use this step to just create the inductive code book as you go through each set of comments. But if you're summarizing, 
what does that look like? So I'm very fond of using Excel spreadsheets to track and document my process. But what I did was I initially opened up a Word document and went through the um, two transcripts and noted everyone's comments. And at this point, the entire team is generally, we're all very, very um, close to one another in terms of how we've interpreted and coded the data. But as many of you know, um, if you're going through a transcript from top to bottom, often someone will say something at the beginning and then they'll repeat uh, a similar idea at the end. And so use, starting with the Word document allowed me to then cut and paste and group things into thematic groups and then put the thematic groups in um, their respective columns here. And then I combined them. So in this combined inductive codes, you can see there are two um, parent codes. So one of these would have been from uh, participant 2100 and the other uh, 5024 with uh, the smaller thematic um, notes underneath. And then what I did was I, I streamlined those um, in a subsequent column. And this is what I would then present to the team. So step six is finalizing the code book. As I mentioned, that could happen at the same time as you discuss the, the findings, um, preliminary findings from the, the inductive coding exercise and the com going over the comments. But you can also take that summarized um, thematic groups and incorporate it to the a priori codebook. And this is, to, this is what we did recently for a hypertension study. So here, this, um, these two first two columns, B and C, were from the a priori codebook. And we initially had a parent code that was diagnosed as a model for hypertension. But after doing the inductive coding, we recognized that this should actually be split into two. So diagnosis for hypertension and model for hypertension. And that meant we had to divide up these child codes between the two. And you can see 1.1, 1.5, that initial one pertains to the parent code and then the subsequent one is switch child code. And then beside these child codes, I put the inductive codes that we had developed so that way we could see these mostly pertain to, to this particular initial child code. And we could either um, start the discussion from, from this point, or um, we could just basically merge that column C and D together into something that looks like this. And what I liked about this is when we went over it, we had grouped similar um, inductive codes together. And we would then discuss, all right, do these warrant being separate codes or should we combine them? And if we combine them, what is the, the wording that we'd like to use? So that way everyone knows the range of elements to which we'd apply this or that code. And you can see that we've done that for both um, the name of the parent code. So popular models could be popular beliefs, or as an anthropologist, I like saying folk etiologies and illness narratives. Um, we decide on that, finalize it, and then we put the definition for the parent code underneath. And we put the definitions for the child codes on the side in this column. And often what we might do is say, well, this knowledge of symptoms, causes, and consequences, it's all the same as understanding of hypertension etiology. So then we'd have the definition that says includes symptoms, causes, consequences, etc. cetera. Um, one of the things I have here is no knowledge. And I often kept that separate because from experience, I've noticed that I and some of my team members, if the interviewer asks, so what causes hypertension? People might be like, oh, getting stressed up, too much meat, too much salt. And then some people would say, I don't know. And the people who say, I don't know, ended up not getting coded. So specifying no knowledge was also important for us to, to include. Um, 
one of the challenges with making a code book from the inductive codes is um, you end up with lots and lots of codes from, from that line by line inductive coding. And this step is essential for slimming things down so that you don't have a code book that has a hundred codes. Our team is, is most effective when we have maybe 30 codes, maybe 40, if we have a set of like 10 codes that apply just to a subset of the population, because we're able to keep uh, this smaller number of codes in mind. So what we've discovered is that when we use this method, we can do it remotely and we can do it much faster because each team member can do that inductive coding on their own time. And um, it's all documented in a way that is then combined and stored in, in folders. It allows us to display each of our inductive coding and what exactly we coded specifically. When we go over that, that develops um, greater team consensus and confidence and collegiality as we share one another's perspectives. And it opens up really, really interesting conversations where sometimes we learn about, for example, well, in the world culture, this is what's going on. And so the folks from California and Uganda are like, oh, okay, so now we understand this and that happens. Um, but beyond speeding up the, the coding um, and allowing us to do it remotely, which actually is I feel it's kind of a drawback for me because then I don't actually get to go to Kenya to, to be with my team. Um, it allowed us to develop much more culturally rigorous interpretations and analysis of, of the data. And it's allowed the team members from the community to bring the ideas and questions that are important to the community and which they've uh, encountered in doing the interviews, they've been able to bring that to the development of a code book. And if it gets coded, then later we're able to pull those bits of data out and work them up into a paper, which is important to, which is a, a, a paper on a topic that's important to the community. So We've been able to, to start breaking down some of the global north, global south barriers, and we've been able to start involving the um, kind of community engagement as kind of community represented through our um, team members. And as a result, we have much, much stronger analysis and much stronger papers. So um, I see that there are lots of of comments and questions in the chat that I've not been able to look at. So I will stop sharing and open things up for questions. Yeah, first of all, Jason, congratulations on this fantastic talk and um, all of your spearheading of this work. It's just been a fantastic, um, like taking our work to, to a next level. Um, there were some questions that came up in the chat and a couple of things that I thought we should just give us context. All of this is the kind of um, preparatory work that would happen before a team begins to work with a qualitative software program. So um, everything that Jason just described is all about the process of making sure that everyone has had a chance to participate in the in the conceptualization of the categories of meaning for the analysis and has had um, you know, has been involved in the development of the codes so that everyone can apply the codes um, consistently. So it's a way of kind of ensuring intercode reliability or kind of full interpretive participation participation before you're actually working with the software. So everything then leads to the development of Kobik that they can then get uploaded to deduce, which is what we're using these days. In the old days, we were using Atlas TI before there was good internet um, connectivity. And the only other thing I would note is that this team that we've been working with, I've been working with since for like a decade. So the only other thing to note is the team members who are engaged in this work 
have had multiple stages of training in coding. So um, I think that it's um, everything that Jason just described still follows after a good bit of in-person training um, so that, you know, because everybody probably here, uh, you know, has experienced what it's like when people are new to qualitative analysis and they are just sort of putting things down from their head instead of being really close to the text. So Jason's method really um, is something that allows us to kind of codify what has been our ethos to follow Sharmaz's constructivist grounded theory approach where you are really trying to center the voices of the participants and be and stay very close to the text. So this process that Jason described is like step one of Sharmaz's process, the open coding that then um, leads to the second stage of focus coding is something that um, is kind of the, it's the kind of interpretive, specific interpretive tradition that we're trying to follow um, through the use of this process. Um, but but people still needed that initial, they still do need the initial um, training in person, I think, personally. But once that's happened, this process that Jason developed has just been very, really improved the rigor of the work and um, really ensured full inclusivity of every member of the team. So, Thanks for that context, Carol. Um, I do see two questions, one from Elizabeth, one from Ryan. So Elizabeth asked uh, about the process uh, benefits of using software after doing this process. So, and do you upload your coded transcripts into to do Atlas TI? So what we do is we, we've coded these um, sample transcripts in Word, and we use that to create a code book in Excel. And then what I do is I create the code book in Deduce based off that Excel document. And basically all I do is I cut and paste parent coach had code and definitions from each of the, the cells. And then we upload blank transcripts into Deduce. And I assign each team member a set of uh, transcripts to code. Typically what I do is I assign the transcripts to someone who did not do the interviewing but every now and again, I will, <clears throat> I do try to assign um, the interviewers at least one transcript that that they were the interviewer for. And I do that because something that you know, I've discovered in my professional career is when I go through a transcript where I was the interviewer, I can see those missed opportunities where I didn't ask a follow-up question or I didn't explore something. And so I feel that assigning at least one transcript to the interviewer, him or herself, helps um, develop the interviewing skills for, for But why not all, Jason? Studies. Why not Why not have the interviewer code all of their own work knowing that they were there? So I'm really curious about why, why have someone else do it? There were two reasons for that. One was sometimes, some days, like, you know, someone might be out on leave. And so we suddenly have like 10 transcripts from one interviewer and three from the second interviewer. So we want to make sure that um, all the work is spread out evenly and, and can proceed apace. But we also wanted to make sure that other team members were aware of these other um, perspectives from the community. So it would broaden the, the knowledge base of everyone on the team about um, what you could call the ethnographic situation of, of our um, participants. And then it looks like Carol answered Ryan's um, question. Amy, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just curious about um when you're deciding on the final codes as a team and when people may disagree on certain codes and how those disagreements are handled in the field and maybe 
how the final decisions are made to achieve equity um, and giving maybe priority to the people that collected the data who know the culture and context better than um, us at UCSF. Sure. So I am working with a team of Africans and one of the cultural aspects that's common to, to many of the ethnic groups in, in East Africa is the, the palaver, which is where everyone sits down and talks through a situation. And so what we do when there are disagreements is each person offers their perspective and then we keep going and going as um, people weigh the benefits or, or drawbacks of, of using one particular language or one particular um, interpretation of, of that um, set of data. And um, what happens is maybe sometimes four of us support one thing and one person um, supports another. We keep talking and, and um, they try to persuade us, we try to persuade them. And ultimately what happens is either the person says, oh, I see what's going on now, or the other people say, oh, I get it. And ultimately we we reach consensus. I don't think there's been a time where we, we actually not reached a consensus. Um, and we actually explicitly say, so why don't we choose this name or this approach? What do people think? Is this acceptable to you? And often people will say, you know, after hearing these arguments, I I understand and and I can I can do that. Sure. That's that's what we'll do. I would say in earlier years, it wasn't as easy to have consensus. So this is also a seasoned team that's worked together for a while, which helps. Thanks so much, Jason. This is so interesting. I dropped in the chat um, my team, a team I'm working with, and I recently published something a, a little bit similar, but for a full analysis process. So it's not um, focusing on the code book. And so this, these are things I have thought about a lot. And one thing that came up for us was time. Um, and I know that um, you may have addressed this earlier in the talk, so I apologize if I'm asking you to repeat, but could you talk a bit more concretely about the amount of time each of these meetings took, the process overall? Because for us, this was like such a long process and um, it's hard to get funders on board with that timeline, I think. So any thoughts you have about, about that? Sure. So is the question specifically about using this method in, in the time for this method, or is it a, a more general question for time of doing, collecting the interviews and then going through the analysis and so on? Uh, specifically about this method, kind of the amount of time that it took, you know, scheduling each meeting and then sort of the overall timeline. Sure. So we meet every two weeks, typically for an hour. And um, when we're doing this, this code book development, um, the first time it actually took, it took a long time because it was new for all of us. This most recent one, I think we had one hour and a half long meeting and um, where we were discussing the, the inductive codes and integrating them into the a priori code book. And we ended up with, I think, four codes that we weren't quite sure what to do with. And we followed that up with email about whether they should be included in the, the final code book. The, the longest part is if we decide to go over the comments as a team, because that depends on the length of the transcript and it depends on if we're going over transcript A, transcript B and, trans and transcript C. And when we, when we did that, um, that, that's a two hour meeting at least, and it's often more than one two-hour meeting for each transcript. And the reason for that is because we go through each set of comments and then we really dive in into what's going on. And sometimes um, if there is a particular uh, cultural element that the rest of the team members aren't aware of, explaining that can, can take up more time and then that gets discussed further. If you're only summarizing the comments and, and doing the um, integrating the inductive and a priori code books, that's typically just one, maybe two meetings that's an hour and a half, maybe two hours. 
But like I said, that's not at all what it was like the first time around. The first time around, it took us much, much longer to, to do everything. Thanks. That also validates the amount of time it took us. So I'm just, I was also kind of curious, comparatively speaking. Thank you. So Jason, as someone who does not do line by line coding, can you help me to visualize what a 15 page transcript might look like when you're going through doing line by line coding? And I am guessing that you're not trying to code every line, but maybe you are. So I just give me a sense of what is, how many comments might you be generating on a 15 page interview? Sure. Um, it does tend to be almost every line except for the um, interviewer's questions. And part of the reason why we don't code the interviewer's question is because the interviewer's question is drawn from uh, a research question or theme. So what I'm doing right now is I'm opening up, let's see, opening up one of the the merged documents so that way you can I'll, I'll share my screen so that you can see. And Sharmas herself says that this first stage of coding should be kind of quick. Like it's not it's meant to be a kind of read through writing comments and not a lot of kind of painstaking work. It's just kind of recapping what someone is saying with an emphasis on gerunds and it's in the, you know, and it's not on all of the transcripts in a study. It's just. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a familiarization stage. Right. It's and, a familiarization. Exactly. Yeah. And if you're staying really close to the text, then I guess it just makes me think that the, range of interpretations that your team may bring is going to be slim because you really are trying to exactly. attend to exactly and reflect back what's there. Exactly. So Good. you can see right here, spend the day supporting health workers who are always immunizing the children as we take their vitals, um, right for them in the immunization card. So prior roles include immunization activities and sanitation being part of team with pediatric focus immunization, formerly participating in hygiene promotion, right? So it is, mm -hmm. it is very slim, but you can see there's a comment for almost every single line here. Yeah, and you're working with translated data. So the passages are not, they're not thick. So, so I, I can see how this process would, does work in, an, in a fairly efficient manner. But this also leads me to the next question, which I think might be helpful, Jason. Like we've talked about how the second stage of focused coding is where we then introduce our own interpretive lens. And that's where we are engaging in abstraction and um, interacting and entering into more of a kind of an interactive space with the participant, bringing our own kind of theoretical or other kind of interpretive overlay. So can you talk about how that kind of, how those discussions have gone? Sure. Those discussions seem to happen in, in, Kind of two stages. One is when we're going through the inductive codes and the comments and, and we're trying to figure out the code name, right? Because that abstracts things. And then the code definition where it, it lists out the range of what's going to be encoded by, by that particular um, code tag. So that's the first step there and that is abstracted. And then the, the second time that that happens is when we create framework tables and we pull data that has been coded because then we're going back to some very specific concrete um, excerpts from each of these interviews. And then we can say, okay, so we've got this abstracted code and we've got now it paired with, with the concrete examples, what's going on? And so that's when we have that that second time of um, further abstraction. 
for for a, a framework table or a thematic analysis. Mm -hmm. You'll have to um, have part two of your R8 model to talk about that and how do you? Yeah, the we'll framework cover. table analysis approach using Google Sheets should be the follow on. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. We are right at the top of the hour and there's one question, um, one more question in the chat um, that Ahmad is asking. And those of you who need to step off, please feel free to do so. Um, and I just wanna say thank you again, Jason, so much for this really rich and fantastic. Thank you for visualizing things for us and explaining the process in such a detailed manner. I feel like I understand what you're doing, which is excellent after only hearing about this for one hour. So thank you very much for your really clear presentation. And um, please, you know, keep us posted on the publication of the paper so that then we can circulate it to the group.